On behalf of the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, I'm so pleased that ANA has asked us to present this webinar for you, the non-ICU nurse who might be taking care of ICU patients. For those of you who are listening who don't normally work in critical care, I want to thank you for stepping up to the plate and helping out in our ICUs and being willing to take care of these patients during this crisis. So there you are, you're listening and you're thinking, I have a patient on a ventilator, what to do? What am I to do? What's gonna happen? Well, one of the things I wanna assure you about is that these patients are very similar to the patients that you take care of every day. They're patients, you know how to do an assessment. You have foundational nursing skills. You can take care of these patients. The only thing that's different with these patients is that they have a lot more equipment attached to them, and I'm gonna lead you through how to assess some of that equipment today. So for this first section on what do I do with a patient on a ventilator, I'm gonna help you look at what is unique for the assessment of a patient on a ventilator, and I'm also gonna help you describe what that assessment would look at and identify some of the important aspects to assess for and intervene with for a patient on a ventilator. So when you're looking at that patient, you know when you go in to do a respiratory assessment or do your basic assessment, you look at the patient, you identify their level of consciousness, you see if they're gasping, if they're short of breath, you glance at the monitor to see what their O2 sat is, and then you pull out your stethoscope and you listen. While lung auscultation for these patients is exactly the same as it would be for your normal patient, you're gonna listen anterior, lateral, and posterior. The difference is you're going to assess more frequently. And you might be assessing more frequently due to changes in conditions, such as you see their O2 sat drop, or they start to gasp, for, or maybe they get a little bit agitated and you can't figure out why. If someone gets agitated, be sure to listen to their lungs. Some of the other additional assessments that you might be including for your patient is an, a, a listening to the breath sounds on their neck, so on both sides of their neck. And why you do that is to identify the functioning of the endotracheal tube's cuff. On the right of the screen, you see a smaller image that shows an ET tube. And the top part of it is where it connects to the ventilator. And then you see a little yellow subglottic suction port. Well, that port goes to a hole that's right above the cuff. That port is hooked to continuous suction in order to remove secretions from the cuff so that they don't slide down the patient's trachea and then they aspirate them. Now, when you're auscultating along the neck, you're going to want to temporarily disconnect or turn off the suction to that, to that tube, the subglottic suction, so that you don't have the normal gurgling sound that's going on in the neck. And then you'll auscultate with that subglottic suction off. And what you should hear is a loud, clear breath sound on inhalation and exhalation. It should just sound like air whooshing back and forth. If it doesn't, if you hear gurgling and the subglottic chin is off, then it may mean that your endotracheal tube cuff is not fully inflated and you may need to address that with the respiratory therapist or the ICURN to help troubleshoot it. So it's really simple to auscultate. You know how to do it. Just add in auscultating on the neck, temporarily disconnect the suction to the subglottic and please remember to hook that subglottic suction back up very, very important to keep it going at a low continuous suction. You're also going to assess that tube, um, the endotracheal tube, where it exits at the teeth or the lips. So it's going to be oral into the patient's mouth and down into their trachea, and then you're going to exit where it, look at where it exits at the teeth or the lips. On the side of the tube are some black writing numbers, and you can see that on the tube on the screen. The tubes represent the number of centimeters from the distal port down below the balloon cuff and how far it is exiting out the patient's mouth. And so generally you'll see that tube exit at the teeth or the lips at 22 to 24 centimeters. It may be more for someone who is shorter and it may be less for someone who's taller. So you'll just need to look at where that is on your patient. It should have been written down when the tube was first placed and then it gets assessed at regular intervals by the respiratory therapist and the nurse to ensure that the tube has not migrated in or out. Another assessment for endotracheal tube location, which is the provider's responsibility, is to assess the, and review the chest X-ray reports to ensure that the endotracheal tube is two to four centimeters above the carina. 
That location is very important. The carina is the bifurcation of the main stem bronch bronchus. And if that tube is close to that bifurcation, every time the patient moves their head back and forth, that tube can actually hit the carina and cause irritation. It may even result in bronchospasm. So that's an essential assessment provider responsibility. But if you're reviewing the chart, it's something that you can look at on the chest X-ray report as well. The other thing to assess about that endotracheal tube is the assessment of the tube's pressure where it's lying on either the lips or on the, t on the um, patient's, the tubing that might go. The other thing to assess um, to help prevent pressure injuries is where the endotracheal tube is lying on the lips and the face. You want to make sure that that tube does not um, cause any pressure injuries to the lips or face. And so you'll wanna assess that. You'll also want to assess the securement device and around that to make sure that that's not causing any pressure injuries as well. You'll also expect the endotracheal tube to be repositioned side to side at regular intervals. And you may be asked to assist with this by stabilizing the tube. The respiratory therapist generally does this, but the ICURN may do that and may ask you to assist. Another assessment, which I know in my career as an educator, either people love AGs or they hate arterial blood gases, but I want to reassure you that you can do this for your patients that you're going to be helping with in the ICU. Arterial blood gases for patients who have developed ARDS are going to be abnormal. So we've all learned those normal numbers. I don't want you to worry about those. I just want you to realize that when you get arterial blood gases, you're gonna be looking for some certain goals for your patient with ARDS based on the strategy that they're managing these patients with permissive hypercapnia. That means they're using a low rate and volume, and I'll talk more about that strategy later. But that strategy of retaining carbon dioxide will result in a blood gas that has a pH of 7.25 to 7.35. The PaCO2, or the partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide, will be greater than 45 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure of arterial oxygen, the PaO2, will hopefully be greater than 80, but it may be as low as 60. And it depends on where you live in the country. If you're in Albuquerque or if you're in Denver, you may be used to seeing lower PaO2s. So you want to check with your providers on what the number is that you're targeting. Hopefully your patients will have an O2 sat greater than 90%, but you may not be able to get that with a patient with ARDS and COVID-19 because they do tend to have a lot of hypoxia. Your bicarbonate, your HCO3, will be greater than 26, and that's in response to the respiratory acidosis caused by retaining carbon dioxide, which is the strategy we're using to manage patients with ARDS called permissive hypercapnia. And believe it or not, and I'm not gonna go into the physiology of it, but permissive hypercapnia actually results in, a, in helping the patient oxygenate better. So that's why we manage these patients with ARDS with low, res low tidal volumes, higher respiratory rates. The strategy is called permissive hypercapnia, and it is what we are attempting for these patients. Now you may be thinking, I don't remember my ABGs. How am I gonna do this? Well, you're gonna work in collaboration with the ICURN and the respiratory therapist, but we've also, AACN has provided a resource for you, free of charge for download as a PDF or to your mobile device on pulmonary management pocket, a pulmonary management pocket card. And it includes information about arterial blood gases, ventilator modes, ventilator settings, and spontaneous breathing trials. And the link is on the slide for you to download that. The other thing you'll be assessing on your patients who are on ventilators is their oximeter and your SpO2 continuously, as well as an end tidal CO2. Most patients will have that assessment as well. So with your oximeter, you're gonna obviously be assessing for changes and your oximeter assesses your patient's oxygenation, how well oxygenation oxygen is being delivered to the lungs. You wanna know the goal for your patient's SpO2. Again, we hope in patients COVID-19 and ARDS, you can get it above 90%, but some patients may be lower than that, and that's the best we can do. You'll also wanna monitor the end tidal CO2, which is 
is abbreviated ETCO2. Patients, the ETCO2 correlates very nicely to the arterial blood gases PaCO2, which is normally 35 to 45. But remember, using the strategy of permissive hypercapnia in these patients, you'll expect it to be elevated. You'll want to consult with your ICURN or the respiratory therapist to determine the parameters to monitor and when it's important to notify someone that it is too high or it's too low. What you're monitoring with the CO2, the ETCO2, is you're monitoring the patient's ventilation, their ability to inhale and exhale gases, or how well the gases are moving in and out of the lungs. 